So we are currently admitting everybody into this session. So we will wait for a couple of seconds before we officially start. So we advise all of you to turn off your audio. So we don't have an echo. Okay, so everybody who were who were in the waiting room are admitted. So I will start then. Hello to everybody. Uh, my name is Nevena Krivokabic Martinovic, and I am the coordinator of Rice Media Law uh, Moot Court Competition. Uh, it is my pleasure that we have the possibility to uh, have a talk from Jonathan McCauley. Uh, Jonathan is currently working as a legal advice, advisor in Digital Freedom Fund. But uh, for us, uh, Jonathan is uh, our long-term friend of the moot who has been uh, judging uh, oral rounds, uh, judging memorials and helping us throughout all of these years with his uh, knowledge and feedback within, within the moot court. So as I said in the previous mooting masterclass that we had with uh, Rafael, uh, I think this is a great opportunity that in these crazy circumstances, we can have and organize these kind of classes for, for participants this year. And uh, usually we do it only in, in Oxford before we start with the competition and mooting itself. But now we have the opportunity to do it much, much in advance. So you, all of you can prepare for your regional rounds that are ahead of you. Um, I won't take too much time now. I will give the floor to Jonathan so he can start with, with his presentation. And then also Jonathan will give you a couple of tips about uh, how to pose questions and how the session will look like. So Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nevena. And um, yeah, thank you, Sanya and Sarah and the organizing committee for, for having me today. Um, and thank you, Mooters, for, for joining. Um, well done for getting this far. And uh, yeah, you've got a great experience ahead of you. Um, and I'm wishing you the best of luck in your, in your moot courts to come. Uh, I feel a bit of an imposter actually coming and onto this Zoom room and speaking about a moot court masterclass because it's kind of embarrassingly long since I have been a mooter. But as, uh, as Nevena said, I've been a judge at the Price Moot Court competition for, I think, over five years now. And I've also uh, litigated before domestic, regional, international courts in, in my old job with free speech cases. So um, I have a bit of practical experience in, in applying some of the legal concepts that uh, you're going to be applying during your moot. But yeah, as I said, it's been a long time since I've, I've been in your shoes. So it might just be that during this masterclass, um, you might gain more of a perspective on how to, more of a judge's perspective on how to approach your moot. Um, and I hope that can still be uh, useful for you uh, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead. So, I actually just wanted to start because it, I, I find Zoom very weird. It's really difficult to interact with an audience on Zoom and it feels a bit like you're just speaking to an empty room. So I actually wanted to start with a question for everybody on the call, just as a bit of an icebreaker so I can kind of get to know you a bit better. Um, so my question to you is, can you let me know in the chat box very briefly I'm just looking for a title. What inspired you to get into law? And I'm looking for something cultural. So I'm looking for, it might be literature, a movie, television, a song even, something that got you interested in, in law or an even legal arguments. Uh, you'll get minus marks for saying something like a Ronald Dorkin book or HLA Hart's concept of law. I'm looking for more like things like Atticus Finch, 
you know, To Kill a Mockingbird or 12 Angry Men or films like this, Damages maybe, maybe it's even Judge Judy or something like that. Just let me know in the chat what has really made you passionate about law, but something that's a bit mainstream, something culturally mainstream. So yeah, tell me, tell me a bit about, uh, about that in the chat so I can kind of get to know what my audience looks like and what your what interests you um, outside of of your academic and your and your legal work. So while you do that, um, I'm just going to take you through the structure of of the session today. So what I'm trying to do is uh, the purpose of this presentation is really to give you some tips, tricks, and maybe destroy some myths for you. Um, that can help you win your moot, um, your upcoming moot. And I've kind of broken down the session into a few, uh, into a few uh, factors or, or issues. So first I'll talk a bit about how you can use your facts to win your case. And then I'll look at how you can use the law to win your case. And then we'll speak a little bit about how you can perfect your legal argument to help you win. And finally, we'll look a bit at how you can engage with your opponent and with the judges to help you win your case um, at your moot. So that's the structure of the session. Um, as, San, as, as Nevena mentioned, uh, you can ask questions in the comments section of, of Zoom while I'm talking. Just let me know if you have a question that you would like clarified. Um, I'll leave the questions until the end of the presentation, but I do encourage you to just write down your question in the chat function whenever it might arise, and I'll come back to it at the end. Since I really like this to be an interactive session, if you don't mind asking your question over audio and with your video on, just write live in capital letters beside your question, and I'll call upon you to, to ask your question. I should warn you though, that this is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube. So don't write live if you're if you're not comfortable with that so yeah please there are no silly questions on this call um, and i'll try my best to answer as many questions as i can at the end and to the best of my my ability so just to start off with um, i'm going to look a bit at how you can use your facts to win your case so this um, moot court is a really great opportunity to apply legal research to something a little bit more concrete, something that might actually happen or exist in the real world. And I think you really have very few opportunities to, to do this in such a practical way uh, during your legal studies. So it can sometimes be a bit novel to be working with a case study and a set of facts in the way that you're going to be working with them during uh, your moot. So some very simple suggestions. You might roll your eyes at the other side of Zoom when you hear these. But um, my main thing about your facts is you really need to be on top of your facts. Uh, be really comfortable with your facts. And I would say almost live the case that you're working with. So know it inside out. And this is super important because uh, when you're actually presenting your oral arguments on the day, uh, knowing your facts and being really on top of them will help you respond to questions, but also navigate maybe some tough legal points or arguments that you might have to respond to uh, during, during your mute, mute. A really important thing about your facts as well is to make sure that you're accurate when you're referring to them, whether in written submissions or in oral submissions. This again seems super obvious, but it can sometimes be missed. Sometimes the silliest things are the most obvious things. Um, and accuracy is, is really key to a successful mood. So really make sure that you're, you're getting your facts correct when you're relying on them in your moot. And I actually have a real, real life 
example of how this could pose a problem to you if you are not really on top of your facts or you miss something or you make a very simple mistake. Um, it can really cost you time, actually. Um, uh, there is a case that, um, quite a well-known case, I won't mention any names, that uh, involved uh, the suing of a state for their criminal laws on defamation. And those taking the case on the front cover of their page misnamed the country that the case was against. It was named correctly everywhere else in the brief. It was just the cover page. And you can kind of understand how this mistake can happen because sometimes the cover page you almost assume must be right and you're going to be reading everything else in, in super, super detail and super closely. But that one simple mistake actually resulted in a controversy before the court and time had to be spent on arguments addressing whether this the impact this mistake or inaccurate statement had on the case. So accuracy seems super obvious as a point, but it is really um, vital to a successful case that you're presenting the facts in an accurate way. And related to that is an important point that you should also avoid making up facts. Um, I've judged uh, moots where this has actually happened, where um, a speaker might be put in an uncomfortable position and they want to rely on a fact that they're not really sure of, or there might be a gap in the case study. So they try to fill that gap by making up facts. And there's two things to note about this. Um, making up facts is something that can be checked and it can be a weakness. It could be determinative in whether you win or lose your case, but it can also be very obvious to the judges in your, in your case that you're, you're doing just that. You're actually, um, you're actually making up facts on the spot. So uh, that would be uh, a significant tip um, from, from, from me that you should really avoid making up uh, facts. So really, really make use of the opportunities to get clarifications on the case study um, and to fill in whatever gaps there may be in the facts that you currently have. And really use facts to your advantage. Your facts actually provide you with the basis to tell the court a story and you can really utilize them to bring life to your legal arguments, but also make your arguments compelling for the judges. The way I kind of would break this down is that behind every case, there is an individual or a group of individuals who, let's say if you're an applicant, has been affected by uh, the measure that you're you're challenging during your moot, and you mustn't forget that, because this is this is what taking a legal case to court is all about. It's about representing an individual victim who's been subject to a human rights violation, and that's a really powerful thing. Um, so if you're finding yourself talking too much about the law, or let's say you're you're challenging the law of a country but really there is a victim behind how that th law is being applied, let's say, you're, you're missing an opportunity to demonstrate the, the real impact behind your case, the real harm that you're trying to remedy or redress by taking the case. So this all goes, I guess, to framing your case. Uh, make sure that you're telling the court a story and that might be, if you're an applicant, a human-centered story. That's going to be much more powerful and it's really going to um, make your arguments more impactful if you're, you're demonstrating to the court uh, what is actually at stake in the legal controversy before them. So the next thing I want to talk about is using the law to win. Now, at the Price Moot Court, we're super fortunate to be working with 
the international human rights legal framework on the right to freedom of expression because it is a super rich area of international law. There are lots of primary and secondary sources to rely on. So the potential to do really deep research on what the law says is, um, is there. You have a real opportunity to do that deep research. So I'd encourage you to, to look into not just the primary sources of law, so that's the international treaties and, and uh, the case law, but also looking at what secondary sources say. There's a huge body of soft law in particular. So these are legal principles that might have been set out by special mandates of the United Nations, let's say, or Council of Europe bodies. Um, there are a lot of detailed uh, principles out there that you can rely on. So really embrace that um, during your, your moot experience. The other thing I'd encourage you to do, like what I said about the facts of your case, really also get to grips with the law that you're working with. And I mean that not just in a substantive sense, but also understanding what where your legal source sits in the hierarchy of laws that you're relying on. So when we're talking about the right to freedom of expression, we're talking about a right that's established in an international treaty. And it's been further elaborated on and enumerated in different sources of law that sit in a hierarchy, starting with international precedent and working its way down maybe to, to case law before domestic or local courts really get to grips of when you're relying on a legal source, knowing where that sits in the hierarchy of laws you're working with. And just to put this very simply, avoid using a decision of the US Supreme Court when there's a regional international human rights court decision that can do the job for you. So that's, um, that's one thing just to get to grips with understanding where the legal source sits in the hierarchy of laws. And the other thing, getting to grips with the substance of what the law actually says. And this is particularly crucial if you're relying on a specific case to advance a legal argument. Really make sure if you are raising it, particularly in legal arguments, or oral arguments, that you know the facts of those cases and you also know the outcome of those cases. And I'm going to give you a practical example here from previous moot court experiences. There's one decision that is often heavily relied on in, in mooting in the, at the price moot court. And that's a case called Handyside and the United Kingdom. And the reason this case is used so much is because it has a lot of great language, very powerful language on the right to freedom of expression. And it has a dicta on the right to offend, shock and disturb, which has been repeated um, consistently in international jurisprudence on the right to freedom of expression. But what is sometimes missed is the fact that in this case, the right to freedom of expression was not violated. So the applicants didn't win in that case. And if you're relying on a case like that, you're opening yourself up to the potential of being asked by a judge, what was the outcome of that case? And if you're an applicant, it might undermine or weaken your position to have to then disclose to the judge that there wasn't a finding of a violation in that case. So you want to avoid getting into a position where your, your law that you're relying on might actually trip you up and might undermine other aspects of your legal arguments and your case. Um, the other, the other point I'd, I'd make is the importance of prioritizing your strongest arguments. And I'm going to get on to oral arguments in a second, but whenever you're presenting your oral arguments on the day of the moot, you're not going to be able to reproduce every single legal argument you have in your written brief. You don't have the time to do that. So you have to be very selective. And you have to make sure that you're prioritizing those arguments that are the strongest. And that doesn't mean just the strongest arguments, 
That also means having the strongest facts. So using the strength of your facts um, to your favor, but also the strongest laws. So, um, so those are, those are the three components that you're looking at when you're thinking about what do I need to prioritize when I'm making oral submissions. You're prioritizing arguments, laws, and facts. So I'm now moving on to how to perfect your oral argument to win. So when presenting your arguments to a panel of judges, it's really important to ensure that those judges are with you all the way in your legal submissions. And one way to make sure that they're with you the whole way is to give a very clear structure to your legal arguments, but also a very clear roadmap to what you're going to be talking about to the judges before you. And this is something that you can really use the law you're working with to your advantage, because the right to freedom of expression under international law has a very clear structure to it to work out whether there's a violation. Uh, a structure that you might already know is referred to often as the three-part test. Really use this three-part test to your advantage in structuring your arguments, but also providing a roadmap to your, your judges. The three-part test kind of gives you four things really that you want to, to show you the judges. You wanna show them that there's been an interference that, it's, uh, that it uh, wasn't provided by law, there was no legitimate aim, and it was unnecessary and disproportionate. There is a very clear legal structure and a roadmap that you can use in your submissions. Um, so that would be, um, I think, my top level tip in terms of how to present your legal argument, a very clear structure at the outset, and clear signaling throughout your legal argument so that you know, or you can make sure that the judges are with you every step of the way. Another crucial thing to bear in mind when you are presenting an oral legal argument, you want to be as off script as possible. So your opportunity to present your case to a panel of judges is not about giving a presentation. You're trying to engage a panel of judges and have a conversation with them so that the correct or right decision on the matter can be reached. So it's not a unilateral thing. It's not trying to give a presentation word for word that you've written beforehand um, to a room of people. It's about having a conversation. And the only way to really do this effectively is if you're really on top of the substance of what you're putting forward. So having a clear structure is important but you shouldn't be having a structure that forces you, let's say, to read off a piece of paper word for word. Um, this is really gonna hinder your ability to engage with judges and other people in the room. Um, but it will also make it difficult to move around your legal arguments. So let's say if you're responding to a question from a judge, which requires you to move to another aspect of your, your legal arguments, or maybe it might be a different submission, uh, if you're able to come off script, you're going to be able to do this much more effectively. You're going to be much more confident in being able to respond to those questions. And also when you're, you're off script, you're trying to be as succinct, clear, and accessible as possible. Um, I would say that clarity trumps completeness all the time. So you're not trying to stuff everything into your, your oral arguments that you had in your written brief, like I said, um, but you, you, al you always want to be clear, you always want to be succinct, and what you're saying always has to be accessible to the judges. Um, and what I would say as a tip is be prepared to, yes, make submissions that are succinct, but also be prepared to elaborate on them. So if I, if I had a very practical tip to give here, 
um, you should be able to present most of your your key legal arguments in you should be able to present each argument in two lines so maybe in preparing you can have the two line version of your argument and the five line version of your argument and be prepared to have to rely on the simplest and most distilled version of your legal argument because there's nothing worse than when you're running out of time and only being prepared to explain a concept or an argument um, in five minutes and you only have two minutes to do it. So really think about how you're going to explain things in the simplest and clearest terms, but also being prepared to expand on them and elaborate on them should a question arise um, that, uh, that requires a little bit more detail to be given. Another tip um, or, or suggestion I would make is um, when you're practicing for the moot and actually on the day itself when you're speaking when you're giving your legal your oral argument constantly ask yourself the speed at which you're giving your legal argument you're probably speaking too quickly always in any circumstance you're probably speaking too quickly so always try to slow down take a breath relax and really use the benefits and the power that go with a pause or a break in your submissions like i said this is not about running through a pre presentation it's about a conversation with a panel of judges which requires them also to be up to speed and on the same page as you and that might take a little while for them to process. So if you have maybe a little bit of a trickier legal argument, um, giving them time and space to catch up with you is, is really beneficial. It's ultimately beneficial to your case. Um, and you're only gonna get there if you're able to slow down and keep at a steady pace and um, and make use of those pauses and make use of those spaces. Another thing that I would just highlight is that if you do speak very quickly, uh, it becomes very obvious when you're having difficulties with your legal argument or when you're, you might be hitting an obstacle because then you'll slow down, then you'll pause more, then you might, there might be longer breaks. And up to that point, it's been kind of a very quick um, oral submission and that can kind of flag or highlight your weakness to both your opponent and the judges so really important is to kind of get your pacing right and make sure that you're you're taking your time most people are going to be nervous I think everybody's nervous when they're doing stuff like like this and nerves are always good I think um, but like I said try to remain calm relaxed and steady in your legal arguments. Um, I also want to give a very um, practical tip around presenting your roadmap to the judges of what your submissions will look like. And I didn't want to put too much writing on slides. So this is the only slide where I have a lot of writing on um, to explain um, the point I'm going to make here. So it's really crucial that you use every opportunity available to you to make your argument to the judges. And what I've noticed in the past to be kind of a blind spot on this is actually when you're telling the judges the roadmap for your case, the structure of your case. There are two ways you can do this. There's one that is simplified, very simple to the point structure. And there's one that's slightly more elaborate, but actually make sure that when you're telling the judges the structure of your case, you're also making your argument to them. And in the latter circumstance, you're actually kind of scoring a goal, I would say, at the same time as telling the judges what you're going to talk about. 
So just to show you the example on the left side, this is the simple way of doing it. I will be making submissions on whether there was an interference provided by law, legitimate purpose, and necessity and proportionality. So that's a very simple to the point structure. That's the headlines, but there's no legal argument built in to that structure that you're giving the court. On the other side, um, this is a way that you can outline your structure to, to the judges while at the same time reinforcing, reiterating the arguments that you're going to make. And this is a much more powerful way of outlining your submissions. So I will be making submissions on the fact that the measure adopted by X in relation to Y interfered with X's right to freedom of expression. The measure was not provided by law. The measure was not in pursuit of any legitimate purpose and the measure was neither necessary nor proportionate. Therefore, there's been a violation of the right to freedom of expression in this case. So even in outlining your case, there's still an opportunity there to, to make your, your arguments. So the next thing I wanted to um, talk a bit about was how to engage with your opponent to win. So obviously in any moot scenario, you are against another party, be that an applicant um, or a respondent. And it is really crucial that you are listening to and responding to the submissions of the other party in your case. And this is another reason why it's super important to try to get off script as much as possible, because responding to your op opponent is often something that needs to happen in the moment, um, or else you might actually find yourself uh, in a difficult position. And I'll explain a bit more in a second uh, what I mean by that. A really important thing about um, when you are responding to your opponent is to make sure you are making use of the opportunity you have to respond to their arguments. So a common blind spot, I would say, or, or mistake that's happened in the past is not making use full use of rebuttals, for example. So uh, and sir rebuttal, sir rebuttals for that matter. Try as much as possible to engage with all the points made. So if there's a rebuttal and three points are made, make sure you're responding to all three of those in the sir rebuttal. Um, if you're only responding to one of them, you're missing an opportunity there. And you might even be indicating to the judges that um, you don't have a response to two of the points that were raised in rebuttal. So um, that's a, yeah, that's a, something I would uh, just highlight. Um, and in responding to your opponent, try to be strategic. So there are a couple of things here that I would just point out. The first thing is, if particularly if you're going first as the applicant, do not give the other side their argument in advance. Um, and this sounds a bit silly, but I've actually seen this happen before. Um, in, in one of the moots that I judged, there is an applicant who brought up a respondent's argument. What they said was, the respondents are probably going to say this, and we would say um, this uh, in response to that, in a way trying to get ahead of um, the rebuttal or, or sir rebuttal scenario. Um, but actually, in the end, the respondents didn't even raise that argument that the applicants had preempted. So it, it wasn't even going to come up. It wasn't even going to be a contention. And actually in doing this, the applicants merely gave the respondents an argument for them and it, and it was a bit of an own goal. So that's, that's one thing that I would just highlight in how you could, uh, you could be strategic with how you respond to your opponents. The other thing on strategy um, would be um, prepare to concede where that is helpful to you. So I think it kind of feels against instinct 
to concede on some things, but sometimes it's just a necessity in in legal arguments that you have to drop your weakest arguments. Um, and there's a couple of things why why this why this is important, but the primary thing I think when you get down to oral submissions is that you have a limited time, and spending time on arguments that aren't going to work is a waste of that time. So for example, in the three-part test, there is usually a legitimate aim being pursued by the measure that's in place. It might be for national security, it might be for public health. There's usually something legitimate behind it. So it may just be a waste of time as an applicant to challenge that point. It might be easier to concede it and move on to the next. And it's worth bearing in mind that the juiciest usual, usually the juiciest legal arguments are, are the arguments that are most up for grabs, are down at the bottom end of the three-part test, if you like, the necessity and proportionality part of the test. That's where the balancing exercise happens. And that's usually where the bulk of the legal arguments will be. So if you're spending a lot of time on legitimate purpose or legitimate aim, uh, you might be reducing the time available to you to engage with these really substantive uh, legal principles. So prepare to concede. And I actually had an example from my own personal um, experience where um, I'd taken a case uh, against a state where the attorney general's lawyer for that state refused to concede that they were bound by the treaty and the court that they were appearing before. And they were really hard line on this um, position and actually hindered their position before the court because they were appearing before a court. They were denying that they were required to appear before. And there was a lot of time wasted on this this kind of, this point that they were just unwilling to concede. And I think it ultimately made their position weaker in the end. So really think about where you might be able to, to concede. Um, how to engage with the judges to win is um, the final thing that I want to talk about. Uh, there's one kind of mantra that I've made up, and I think this kind of a, uh, applies um, or in, in, incorporates a lot of the tips and tricks I would uh, recommend. And that is, if you are losing a judge, you might just be losing the case. And there are many ways in which you might lose a judge. So one way you might lose them is in your signposting and the structure you've given the judge for your legal arguments. Your judge mightn't be following exactly where you are in the logic of your submissions. And if you've lost them, your, your legal arguments can only get you so far. Um, so you're really compromising uh, where you could win in that regard. You can also lose them because of the speed at which you're making your submissions. So if you're talking too quickly, that can lead to information overload. Just remember there's somebody at the other end of your submissions who's trying to digest it and understand it and follow it. And if you're going too quickly, you might just be losing the judge who's ultimately trying to decide in your case. And the other way you might lose a judge is if you're bringing in too much complexity or even flowery language to your submissions in such a way that kind of makes your submissions less accessible or, or less clear. This could really take the force out of your legal arguments. If you're, if you're sacrificing clarity for prose, let's say. So try to make your point as, as clear and succinct as possible in order to avoid losing a judge. 
Another way that you can lose a judge is, and this is particularly difficult in a Zoom context, I think, is in how you present to them. So uh, you're trying to, when you're trying to engage a judge in a physical room, that's very different than trying to engage them on a Zoom platform, but you're trying to make their, your argument really compelling and you're trying to keep their interest in what you're saying. So you might lose a judge by having them lose interest in what you're, you're trying to tell them about. Um, and one tip that I would just really highlight for using Zoom is that where you might be able to see your notes or where you might be able to see other screens, i.e. the judge's actual face, is probably not where your camera is. And to address somebody on Zoom actually requires you to look at your camera rather than at the face of the person you're talking to. And this might be really obvious, but it's it's something to keep in mind um, when you're, you're doing your oral submissions over Zoom. So for example, I'm looking at my camera right now, but if I'm looking here, I'm looking at, uh, at my Zoom um, screen. So you can see the difference there between me looking at the Zoom screen and me looking at the camera. And remember you're, to kind of make eye contact over Zoom requires you making eye contact with the camera. Um, another uh, suggestion in terms of how to deal with judges. Um, so judges, there's ne never one judge the same as the other, I would say. So try and prepare for every kind of judge. Um, it's a myth that your judge is going to know everything. And I mean, in terms of the facts, I mean, in terms of the law, and I mean, in terms of your specific written brief that might be before them. So don't ever go into a moot expecting them to know everything. Be prepared for the ignorant judge and also be prepared for the silly questions and how you're going to respond to them. And yeah, a really important thing to, to flag about this is that when you are asked silly, potentially annoying questions is to not show your frustration with or to the judge and also not to get into a confrontation with the judge. Instead, when you're in this position, you're trying to persuade them to come round to your position rather than tell them that they are wrong in holding a certain position. And those are, those are two very different things and they require a different um, way of speaking and a way of engaging with somebody. So be prepared for the judge with the silly questions, but I'd also say, be prepared for the ones that do know a lot. So be prepared for um, judge, uh, judges who might have been involved even in some of the cases that you're talking about and be prepared for those detailed, actually quite detailed questions where they might arise and how you might respond to them. And this just kind of gets to the point again about really understanding the law that you're working with and being prepared to elaborate on, on the law that you're using. Um, and yeah, really important thing is that um, it's a conversation you're having with the judge and, and not an argument. So I did ask you all to share some of the cultural highlights um, or cultural sources to your inspiration in taking on the law. Um, and a few of those actually are pretty bad examples of how to do oral advocacy in court. I saw like, I think Suits and Silk and Legally Blonde. And actually culturally we're, we're told what a courtroom looks like in a very different way to reality. And I would just kind of highlight this, that when you're trying to make your argument to, to judges, um, try to avoid uh, yeah, having a confrontation, having an argument with them. It's a conversation with them. You're trying to persuade them. Um, and it's, it's not about the drama, it's about the persuasion. Um, when a judge is asking questions, be open to them 
and be thankful for the questions because this is actually an indication of what a judge might be struggling with or what a judge might find less convincing in your legal arguments. So when you are responding to questions, try not to get frustrated, try not to avoid them or avoid responding to them and um, answer them on the spot. Don't say, I'm going to come into that later. That's a really important thing to, to emphasize. And another thing just to bear in mind is I think judges are notoriously bad at keeping time as well. So don't expect them to take on a role like a timekeeper and tell you, I think you might need to move on to your next submission now. That's not going to happen. So uh, really be conscious of the fact that judges can also help you lose time uh, on the day. Um, okay, so that uh, comes to the end of, of uh, what I've got to say. Um, and yeah, uh, I'll open up the floor to, to questions, uh, if that's okay. I think some have come, come through. Yes, Rohan, I think you, you've written live. Do you have a question? You may be on mute. You might have to unmute yourself. Hello, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Um, good afternoon, sir. Um, sir, I have a question regarding um, something you mentioned a bit early on in, in this masterclass. Um, you, uh, you mentioned that that participants must be very clear on the substance of their sources. So for example, if I'm relying on a case, I must be absolutely clear on the facts of the case and, and, the, and the ratio, if you will, of that case and so on and so forth. I, I get all that. My doubt is what is the scope for inference in all of these arguments? So for example, if I have a case and I have a, I have a, I have a factual matrix in that case, I have a ratio. What is the scope for me making an argument that derives from an inf that derives from an inference that I have made from that case? So, something that is not uh, sorry, uh, something that is not explicitly mentioned, right? But that is so obvious that it can be inferred, but it has to be inferred. Like there's a bit of nuance going on here. Yeah, um, I would say that if if it's it's obvious, but you have to make sure, obviously, that the case, what is said in the case, supports that inference. Um, I guess what's what I'm struggling with slightly is the difference between an inference and you applying that case law to the facts before you. Is that would you is that is that how that inference would is that how you would understand an inference, or would it be that you're trying to distill a principle? from the case that isn't explicitly said in the case? Hello. Sorry. Yeah, 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 uh, my bad. <laughs> um, a, a bit of both actually. So it could be differentiating the case on facts, differentiating the ratio of, uh, of the case, but more importantly, um, assume that you are the, assume uh, just as a thought experiment that you are the one who has delivered the judgment, right? And you have made, you have say delivered a principle. And I, I use that principle and say, because you have delivered this principle, you must, you must obviously have assumed something in order to get to that principle. So for example, if you have delivered principle B, you must have made assumption A to, to come to principle B. So, that is the sort of um, inference I'm talking about. Right. Can we use that to to substantiate our legal arguments? Is 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 like do we have enough discretion in order to do that? I think I think it's something that would be open to you to make those kinds of inferences. The only th suggestion I'd make um, is that if there is a source of law that is clearer or that more explicitly supports your position, you, you'd, you'd really wanna be relying on that rather than trying to draw an inference from, from a case. But obviously there's, there's, there's never 
two cases that are exactly the same. So there, there is a certain amount of flexibility in trying to apply the decision in one case to your own, which might involve the drawing of inferences, which is open to you. But this is this kind of goes to the point I made about relying on your strongest law as well. You're also trying to find a legal basis that most strongly supports your position and your submission. Um, and the greater the the distance between your inference and what is explicitly said in a in a court decision, um, the more exposed you will be for um, that argument that say or that submission to be attacked for lack of legal basis. So you're always trying to find something that's more explicit, but this is the nature of the law. We're, we're constantly trying to apply um, legal principles that seem black and white to new scenarios. And I, that, that naturally involves a, a level of, of inference. So I hope that answers your question, Rowan, but you can challenge me if it does not. In the meantime, I can read you out a couple of questions from the chat, Jonathan, if it's easier. Yes, absolutely. So we have a question from Ola. Uh, what if the main issue includes two measures, then how the roadmap can be structured? So it includes two measures. Yeah. So th there's one thing that um, I would just want to indicate at the outset, and that is that often it's missed to be really expensive explicit about what the measures are that you are um, challenging, let's say, in your case, if you're an applicant. So sometimes you can feel the need to just launch straight into the first part of the three-part test, which is whether it's been provided by law. But there's really a step before that, which is clearly setting out what the measure is that you are challenging. So what is the restriction? that you are challenging on, on freedom of expression. And sometimes that's not done explicitly by, by speakers and by parties taking the case. Even, even in litigation before regional international bodies, sometimes it's missed. But there's, there's no clarity on what the actual restriction is before you start applying the test. So this is a really good, um, really good question um, because it kind of forces you to think really really critically about what the measure is and making sure that you're not missing any measures. So thank you for that. And, uh, and in terms of how you might structure uh, your roadmap, what, what I would suggest is not to deal with two measures in the one application of the three-part test. So don't be taking a law and let's say a fine at the same time and apply the three-part test. What you would want to do is take it measure by measure. So take one measure, apply the three-part test, take another measure and apply the three-part test. And at the end, if you have time, you might be able to make a submission on the cumulative effect of those measures and the impact it has on freedom of expression. But in terms of making a really clear argument, separating these things out is, is, um, is much more useful and it, and it will avoid it will avoid confusion. For example, if, if you're challenging uh, a fine and also let's say, um, let's say somebody has been sued and fined for something they've said, you're gonna have maybe have different laws that are relevant to the assessment of whether it's been provided by law. They might be pr pursuing different aims in what they're trying to do. And if you're kind of taking these measures at one time, when you get to these, these submissions, you're going to be trying to deal with them in two different contexts, and it, it might actually get kind of confusing for the judge. So, um, so that that's just one tip um, I would suggest. I see uh, another question from Ola, but I think you already uh, answered it. Um, does we apply the proportionality test only on sanctions? So the question is. And Mm -hmm. Sorry. Shall we apply the three-part test only to sanctions? Was that the question? Yes. Um, so, yeah, this this actually relates to to my previous answers. So, 
there are many ways in which a restriction or an interference on free speech can manifest itself and it won't necessarily be a criminal sanction so when you're looking at the facts before you again you really want to distill or identify what those measures are that are restricting freedom of expression bearing in mind that there might also be a chilling effect as well which also amounts to restriction but um as you as you read through the case law you'll find that there are a variety of different measures that can interfere with free speech from you know criminal sentences to um uh, attacks on journalists to feeling to investigate the murder of a journalist can be an interference so you're really trying to work out even even the existence of a law might interfere with freedom of expression so these are the different measures that you might be looking out for um and it won't necessarily just be a sanction okay then we have two similar questions so i'm going to merge them uh, when we are asked a question that we did not didn't understand or we are able to answer how and what to do uh, we respond with and together with that is uh, thank you for your this insightful presentation my question is that when we are answering a judge's question and we are taking too much of our submission time can we say for example unfortunately my time time is running out but I would love to answer your question at the end or something like that. Um, so on, on the second question there, um, there is some discretion open to judges to provide you with, with more time. So do utilize that and ask for, for more time in order to answer a question. My bottom line would tip would be don't avoid answering a question. So do try to, to answer it uh, where you can. And, um, and judges are usually quite reasonable with this. They're, they're not going to leave you in a position where you will run out of time mid answering a question. Um, they will most likely give you additional time in order to conclude your arguments but what i would say is be prepared to conclude them quickly and this kind of gets to my point about you know having the the simple version of your argument and the long version of your argument and be prepared to have to rely on that two line version of your argument rather than the five line one um so i can't remember the first question which is really bad um was it if you couldn't answer a question was that what it was Sorry, never know, I think I'm I... muted. Sorry. <laughs> so the first question was, uh, if you are unable or do not understand the question, how to deal with that? Okay, so the, um, the main thing to do is to ask the judge to clarify the question if you if you're not understanding it. I think that's the only time you can really ask a judge a question. So um, you can ask for further clarification. It's best to do that than respond to a waste time responding to um, a different question entirely uh, because you've, you've misunderstood the question. So asking for clarity on the question, um, if you can't respond, respond to a question, this is a difficult question. This is a difficult thing to answer because um, prevention is better than cure in a scenario like this. You want to avoid getting into a position where you can't answer a question that a judge is putting to you. The best thing you want to, best thing for your case is that you can answer it. Um, so I, I would recommend that you, you try to get yourself to a position where you're only misunderstanding the question because it's poorly asked rather than not being able to answer it because you don't have full knowledge of the facts or you're not sure on what the legal position is. Um, or because you, you don't have a legal argument to support something in response to that question. So I know that's that's a bit of a an evasive answer, but honestly, I think that's prevention is better than cure in, in a scenario like that. Thank you, Jonathan. We have a couple of more questions. Uh, regarding applicant not advancing respondents' arguments preemptively, 
can we say that such and such point written in the respondent's memorial uh, written submission is wrong? Um, I think I think my my recommendation would still stand in this scenario. Um, again, you're 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 taking you're taking up your time as an applicant to raise an argument that may not be advanced by the respondent in their oral submissions. So you're almost you're still kind of giving an own goal in this scenario. Um, don't forget that no, the written briefs are not going to be comprehensively covered in oral submissions. So um, I would I would really say avoid this. If there's a way of making your point, because you're probably saying that their position is wrong because your position is something, I would just go with your position first um, and, and be ready with a, a rebuttal later on that uh, would address the other side's position and just wait for that position to be put forward by the other side and don't preempt it. And the last question is, uh, hi, Jonathan, thank you for your great presentation. I have two questions. What is uh, the appropriate title to refer the judges? My Lord, Lady, Judge, Your Excellency, etc. And the second question, is there a correct manner or formula to use when responding to questions? Um, I'm hesitant to answer the first question because I think there might be <laughs> rules with the price mood competition around how you refer to judges, is that right? So we don't have any formal rules in a way, what is the as precise, um, precise uh, referral. So I, I would say from this perspective, your excellency, your judge, uh, it, everything out of those is, is completely fine and nobody would take it uh, as a mistake if, if you address judges respectfully in that manner. Because I, I know as well, it can vary from context to context, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, how you address judges in your, your own country. Um, for example, I would, I would always go for your honor or something along those lines, but um, I think as Nevena said, it's not something that you'd be penalized on. And in terms of a formula for responding to the question, um, uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if it's a formula, but um, it's more it's more of a suggestion uh, that make sure that you're actually um, engaging with the question, which seems a bit obvious, but you might think a question is an opportunity to make a really good argument that you're about to make. So you want to avoid um, doing that and not answering the question. So make sure that you're you're really engaging. You're not answering something that's pre-prepared. You're you're um, processing the question and, and responding to it uh, in the moment. Um, don't say, I would say, don't say I'm coming to that later or my colleague is going to address that. Try to respond to it in the moment. That question's been brought up in the moment. Um, so it's it's best to, to respond to it there and then. Um, and in terms of manner, like I said, responding, sometimes you can get frustrated because you might be interrupted mid flow. Um, do not show your frustration. Engage with the question in a respectful way. Thank the judge for the question. Um, like I said, it's a good thing they're asking a question. It shows that they're with you, hopefully. They're engaged at the very least. They are, you, you haven't lost them in the sense of lost interest because they're asking questions. So it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. Um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, be, be respectful. Don't ask a question back um, unless it's to clarify, if you're wanting clarity. Um, don't do it in a confrontational manner. Um, these, are, these are the main things I would, I would recommend in, in terms of responding to questions. Thank you, Jonathan. So uh, those are all the questions that we had in the chat. And I 
see uh, by the clock that our time has run out. So I want to use this opportunity first to, um, okay, we have just one question that arrived. So let, uh, let's ask Jonathan to answer the, the last one. So the question is, do we have to ask judges if they have any further questions before moving on to the next argument? Um, so you don't have to, but I would strongly recommend that you do regularly check in with the judges in this way. So um, you're, you're wanting to give them the opportunity and also encourage them to ask questions um, and engage with your submissions. So giving them that opportunity, not too regularly, but at, at appropriate moments is, uh, is a really good uh, is a really good thing to do. So thanks, th thanks for that comment. I should have probably said that earlier. So um, it also shows that you're open to questions and questions won't be met with hostility or frustration. And it ensures that the judges are on the same page as you. Um, it can also, so a really important thing is to read the judges that you're making the submissions to. And you kind of have to adapt and move on move on your toes if you like pivot on the basis of the kind of vibe or or feedback you're getting from judges and questions are a really good way of actually getting instant feedback from a judge because you can kind of tell what concepts they might be struggling with what they mightn't find convincing if a question is challenging your position or challenging your reading of something that's a pretty good indication that the judge is not convinced by what you're saying. So questions are should never be seen as a waste of time or an obstacle to be surmounted. Um, it's a really great opportunity to know what page the judges are on and continue a conversation with them uh, about your case. So. Okay, in the meantime, we've got two more questions. I, I will reply to the first one. How do we address the judges? We already talked about it. Uh, your honor, your excellency uh, is completely appropriate way. There is no, um, <clears throat> nothing is uh, written how you should do it. You can choose. Uh, we have a question, how should we use a fact which is debatable in the case? And if there is a, uh, this is a, another question, if there is a not clear information in the facts and it is important on the one, of, sorry, and it is an important one in of the issues, how can I tackle the situation? So um, in your moot, the facts that are made available to you are I believe, I believe the position is the facts are settled. So your, your arguments should be arguments of legal principle and application of law to the facts that you have. And I, I'm, Nevena, you can jump in if I'm wrong here, but I believe that you shouldn't be making arguments as to facts um, of the case. So there shouldn't be a dispute on the facts. Um, so in, 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 in other court proceedings or in other litigation, you'll have an opportunity to, to um, make arguments on the facts and settle the facts before you move on to the merits, which is the legal arguments and, and what the law says in relation to those facts. With the moot, you're going straight into the merits and you're not having um, a trial on fact and what the factual scenario is. So you shouldn't really be debating what actually happened. That, that should really be settled. So, um, and I know that you probably already have found gaps in the case facts available to you already. And Nevena, you can correct me, has there, there will be an opportunity to ask for um, clarity on those facts? Yeah, the, the, the process was done and some of the uh, regional rounds already got answers and some of them will get them uh, two weeks before the memorial memo, memo deadline submission. 
yeah so that's a really great opportunity to to get more clarity on the facts but also there might be an opportunity to fill in missing gaps if if you've if you find them but from my experience the case facts at price moot are usually pretty comprehensive they're usually all you need and there, there usually isn't anything ground too groundbreaking in the clarifications so um so don't debate on the facts and most importantly as i said earlier don't make up any facts and that includes on the spot on the day when you're making oral submissions you're in a really tight space you really want a fact to be the case but you're it's just not in the information you've been provided up to that point it's going to be something that's so easily checked but it's also going to it can be quite obvious when you're making up a fact on the spot so um so yeah that's a that would just be my my tip there okay great so as i said uh jonathan thank you very much for for this um uh this talk i i'm sure that this will be really really useful to the participants and i also want to thank my colleague sanya that uh, is behind all of this for helping us uh, making sure that all the technical things are, are okay. And as well, I, th I want to thank all of the participants. There were more than 80 people uh, in this Mooting Masterclass. And uh, to wish you all the best in upcoming regional rounds that are ahead of you during the uh, uh, end of January, February, and early March. And to wish you to qualify for international rounds. And we will definitely all see each other in, in following months. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again to everybody and Jonathan especially.